as I'm thinking of, you know, if I'm creating a map or something, the first thing that I do is, well, what's the goal of my map? Is the goal of my map to, um, to you know, engage, engage the audience? Do I want to get a bunch of, like, do I want to get Twitter feeds on, on a map, for example? Or do I want to get, um, do I want to use it as a tool for public policy? Or do I want to, you know, impact internal de decision making? Um, so think about all of the content that you have that you could put on a map. And this, these are some examples of what you can take and what you can visually display in a geospatial format. Um, the most obvious ones are GIS or GPS data. Just you know, plug in like a Garmin or Magellan unit and show GPS tracks and show them you know spread over time. Um, but then you can also take YouTube videos and put YouTube videos in a map. Um, and this is the thing that's that's really exciting is that people are getting very very creative with their maps and what they can do. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about a couple of the tools that are most important for interactive mapping, um, and probably the. The easiest and the lowest hanging fruit, the one that everybody can do, is Google My Maps. And it's basically if you take Google Maps and edit it. And then there's Google, the Google Maps API that um, that is a little bit, um, it's somebody who's a developer is, is going to have an easier time using the Google Maps API. But it's basically the richest way that you can customize your own map. You can take your own custom data and put it into a map and make that map queryable. And then there's Google Earth, which you're all mostly familiar with. And most people, like almost, I don't know, like maybe 95% of people who I've spoken with fly to their home and then kind of like step back and say like, okay, well now what do I do? Well, what you can do is you can create um, compelling visualizations. They're called narrated tours is one example of, of what you can do where um, where you fly somebody into an area while you're adding narration and then pop balloons that tell stories about that area or um, pop videos or uh, yeah and then and then continue flying along on sort of like a geographic storytelling tour. Fusion Tables is a new tool that it's it's not underneath the geo sort of umbrella but it's becoming really really important for a geographic display of spatial information because it's, as you can kind of see in this little image here, it's taking spreadsheet data, taking data that you, you know, like Excel data or, or data that you would display in, um, in spreadsheets and using it as kind of a database in the cloud where you populate those, the spreadsheet with information and then you click visualize and you show it in an instant like that on, on a map, either a point map just with points over the globe or an intensity map like this. So um, the cool thing about this is that it's similar to a more rich application that Maps API provides, but you don't have to be a developer to use it. It's surprisingly easy to embed both Earth and Maps into your website. Um, Maps provides you with embed code that you just plug right into your website, because a common question from people is like, okay, once I've created this cool map, how do I share it with people? So. Um, with Google Earth, there's a little gadget that does the same thing. So now to get into some of the cool examples. So has anybody seen um, the film, The End of the Line? In the promotional website for the film, they had a, an application here where you can, in support of the film, you can sign up and claim your piece of the ocean. I don't know, I think the value of something like this is, um, is that I'm one little person here in San Francisco. I feel like, why should I even care? Why should I even do anything? And if I see that map, I'm like, wow, there's so many people. It's really, it turns a grassroots effort into a global effort. So a lot of people have been really interested recently in set having SMS text messages sent to a map. So Ushahidi is, um, is a small group of people in Nairobi, in Kenya, who, um, who created this open source platform that lets you basically you know, take SMS messages from the public and put them into a, a database and display them on the map. So let me pull this one up. And this one is an example of, um, it's the accessibility of certain drugs in East Africa. And if there's, if you're out of stock, you would send a text message. You're at a health, health clinic. You have nothing around you. You have no facilities or anything. But everybody has a cell phone these days. 
even in the remotest part. So you just text message, say I'm out of, you know, I'm out of Cipro or something, and they can, you know, delegate people and send people to re replenish your supply of Cipro. So um, there's just some really powerful things you can do now with the, you know, with a connection of mobile and geo. And then the final example is um, is narrated tours in Google Earth. They house around two-thirds of the world's land-based species of plants and animals. The remaining tracts of forests influence day-to-day -day weather, but also help to keep the climate stable over time. Tropical forests cover only 7% of the world's land surface, but they store vast amounts of carbon. Logging and burning releases that carbon into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change. Tropical deforestation accounts for an astounding 20% of worldwide. So this is, right now, this is a YouTube video, but it's also a, um, a Google Earth layer. So I could send somebody this Google Earth layer, and they could pause the tour and play around with it. And, you know, if I'm sp specifically interested in, say, Borneo or something, I would fly into Borneo and, and then hit play the tour and resume the tour. So... Um, it's, uh, it was, this is a pretty new functionality of, of Google Earth. It's been around since February. And, um, and we've seen a lot of people use it to, use it sort of as a storyboard, um, a, a storytelling environment, um, and creating a real sort of cinematic experience from within Google Earth. So we're pretty excited about this one. So my name is Margot Brennan, and I'm a project director for Radical Designs, <clears throat> which is a small web development company based here in San Francisco. And we work primarily with nonprofit, grassroots, political campaigns, um, organizations focused on social change. And when we first got an invitation to come and speak at BayVac, I have to admit, I wrote back and said, why? Um, we don't particularly work on video, and so I was a little confused. We definitely use mapping technology, and we work with a few organizations that leverage video, absolutely. Um, but Wendy wrote back, and she explained to me that she wasn't asking me to come here and talk necessarily about technology as much as impact, about how we use mapping technology, how we use maps on the internet to connect with audiences. So um, we work with these organizations that are mission-driven, and we assume that as... Um, that means we have audiences that we're trying to connect with. And you as filmmakers have audiences you're trying to connect with. For these nonprofit organizations, they're usually trying to turn that connection into an action, into something that, that's concrete, that has an effect on the world. I don't, I, maybe you guys are just trying to get everyone to show up at the theater, but um, we've got a few examples of that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, what Wendy said is very true, and I, and I think Tanya did a really good job pointing this out. The first thing we always use maps for is to find ourselves. If you remember the first thing you did with Google Maps is exactly what she's probably describing with Google Earth. You went, okay, where's my house? You know, and I can show Google Earth or Google Maps to someone who has no ability to use the internet, and most of them will immediately go, oh, let me find myself. Um, so the impact that maps have, um, our clients have taught us, literally our clients have taught us. They've come to us and we look at mapping as a technological problem to be solved. Our clients tend to come to us and talk about mapping as a way to engage an audience. They believe that those maps give a sense of how the work that they're doing affects someone in their area. So we're gonna fade into the future a little bit. Um, there's three things that are going to probably impact, and this little tiny slide, are going to impact the future. And um, Tanya talked a, quite a bit about uh, the track, tracking our pathways through the world and Google Earth and the ability to sort of move through time and space. Um, the real-time web. Now, Ushahidi, this is, Tanya already touched on this, and I'm just gonna show you it again really quickly. The trick about Ushahidi, and I'm not sure Tanya mentioned it, is it's not only about sending information out to the internet, it's about then getting information back. So when you're engaged in a crisis, when there's something going on in your country and you wanna know about it, you're not only contributing information about your location, but you're getting that information back from, that inf from other people making contributions. Um, augmented reality. How many folks here have actually played around with the iPhone's augmented reality tools? Right on. So for folks who don't understand, um, with new smartphones, we know where we are in the world, and so we can present information about that location to the user. So for folks who 
are used to creating video where you are guaranteed that your audience will walk into a theater and watch that video. Um, in the future, there's an opportunity to say, let's watch people watch video, watch my film in the context of a particular location, whether that means you're moving around and exploring a space or exploring a city, seeing that film in that location affects its impact on you. So we're really looking forward to starting to do some of this work. This is stuff that's really cutting edge we haven't had a chance to play with yet. Um, the stuff that's coming our way more often is this idea of finding paths or tracks. A lot of our organizations are coming to us asking us to chart the path of their organization, the path of their um, supporters, to create interactive maps that say, look at us, go from point A to point B, follow us through this area. Hi there. Um, I'm Erica. It's really exciting to be here tonight because um, what you're seeing is the really wonderful, wonderful outcome of the 2007 Producers Institute um, experience that we had when we were here. I'm with the working group and what we do is we create films about what happens when people in a community decide to stand up to hate and intolerance. How this all got started really was Basically, our producers, Patrice O'Neill and Ryan Miller, creating this series of films that were shown on PBS, and people actually using the films that, that they work to create in their own communities to start their own anti-hate campaigns. And so what we decided to do through the, the magic and wonder um, of the Producers Institute, who allowed us to create a prototype and then later work with um, some fabulous web designers and developers, is to use a map that helps connect people who are using our films um, and tell the story of what people are doing across the United States and really around the world to affect positive change in their communities. So I can tell you a little bit, or I'll show you a little bit about um, what this looks like. So you're looking at our map here and you'll see that the map shows data points that represent um, not only recent hate crimes, but also the green dots of where people are taking positive action and where local movements are happening. Um, so one of the examples that I can show you here is um, we've got a link to one of our videos um, showing, for example, when the Klan came to rally in Kokomo, Indiana, um, the citizens actually came together and you can watch a documentary about that and if you're in that area you can also see who else is in the area using the film and connect with them. So what we're doing really with this map is it's not just about kind of putting our resources up there but it's allowing people to actually put themselves on the map and share what they are where they're what they're doing in their local communities. One of the interesting things about the map too and about just our films in general is um, people have actually used Not In Our Town to start their own groups. And what we decided to do is basically use the map to show where they are and what they're doing. And so, for example, you can look here in West Virginia and see that there's a group that is a Not In Our Town group that's not only you know putting themselves on the map physically, um, but they're working towards an inclusive community. and they're showing up on our site. They've got their own group page um, as well. So if you see these folks, you can see exactly what they're doing. Um, it shows a little bit about the group and the group members can then update their own individual group sites which then appear on the map. So really what we've done is create a space where people can put, them, put their groups on the map they can put themselves on the map, and then they can join others who are taking positive steps to social change. And <laughs> yes, yay! And um, so it's really exciting. It's um, we're right now kind of previewing the site, and we're connecting with our community members who are who are doing this kind of work and um, showing them how to use this. So it's been a really interesting process for us because. You know, it's not just about creating the technology, but it's getting people to really use it and get familiar with it. The other interesting part about this too is that people, you can put yourself on the map and show that you're 
taking action against hate in your community. And to get listed, um, you don't just add your name, but you show what you're doing. So if you're interested in, in getting on the map, you can um, start a Not In Our Town group, you can host a screening, organize a forum, write an op-ed, and, um, and that's how you get your dot, but most importantly, too, you let other people in your community know, hey, I'm standing up to hate, and I'd like to connect with you, too. So that's why we do the work that we do. I've had an interest in, in visualizing how to get to places uh, that are a little bit more remote. The maps in Laos, Cambodia, uh, uh, Burma really stink. I mean, they're awful. Uh, so getting into the rural, rural areas, in a lot of cases, is just big blank spots. What we're trying to do is work with people, locals there, that know the ground truth to do updates. And so now we're leveraging people in Laos and Cambodia, mostly in urban areas now, to do updates to uh, make the maps better. And there's layers, if you've looked at Google Earth, of other sorts of um, objects than film right now. There's Panoramio that does uh, photos, and there's also Wikiloak that does roots. And so what I've been doing in conjunction with my updates, and I can see how it could translate to videos as well, is showing street signs, basically. You know, turn here to go to the temple. So you're out in the middle of rural Lao, where I'm not, I'm not necessarily a really good Lao speaker, and I've gotten lost kind of really a lot. So what I do is I have my little GPS, and I take a picture of the sign that says, you know, go this way in Lao and, and mark it, and then maybe put it up on Panoramio and also show it on Wikiloak, show the route. The bottom line is that anybody can use Google Map Maker. It's uh, available for 174 countries. Uh, what you really should do is go and do stuff in Laos and Cambodia so I don't have to do it all the time. <laughs> and, and trace over roads and, and, and canals and all the rest of these natural features. And part of it is we're trying, um, some of the folks at Google and I are trying to get the attention of some of the embassy and USAID and others because what I really want to do is not just roads, but look at power plants and water purification and some of these other things to try and figure out how to do some more infrastructure stuff. Now the last piece, and maybe the best, best time to film, is some of these guys uh, that are doing the tour groups for travel are in fact doing videos of showing how one gets across a rustic bridge out in the middle of nowhere. And so what I can conceive and what I was planning on doing on my next trip, take a camera, my flip video or who knows what, geolocate, so it's the next step past the panoramio stuff. So we had the, the still photos, we had the wiki loke showing the roots, and now we can actually go and some of these things that are basically unmapped, rustic bridge, going across a ford with some video, and show others how to, how to actually traverse it, how bad is it, how deep is it, all of those kinds of things. So it's more of a, you know, I don't know, a do-it-yourself travel log. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Quest, KQED, uh, launched a science, nature, environment uh, project about mm, it's three years ago now. And from the very beginning, we said this is going to be a multi-platform project, and it's going to um, not just be a TV show with a companion site, not be a radio show with a companion site, but actually have uh, online as the center. And because it's a science, nature, environment project about the Bay Area, place was the centerpiece of that. So we actually made the site to uh, have place at its center. As you see right here, this is the home page of it, and it is a Google map. Uh, thank you, Google Map API. Um, you'll see all those different waypoints on there. Actually, every time a TV crew goes into the field, every time a radio crew goes into the field, they are making uh, GPS locations of where they're doing their shoot. So you can actually navigate all the content of Quest by location. Um, if you watch any of the video segments, uh, I invite you to do so at home. You actually see the Google map fly in from the Google Earth. Uh, at, the, at the top end of many of the pieces. I wanted to show this one because this is part of what we do for educators. So we believe that, um, so 
public broadcasting was actually founded, um, particularly public television, around education. You remember Sesame Street? Uh, back 40 years ago, it was really a radical concept to go out and say, this medium, this new thing called television can actually teach ABCs. People actually didn't believe that. It was really quite a radical idea. Uh, Sesame Street sort of broke the mold. You can new, use new technologies to teach. Uh, 40 years later, uh, internet is that new technology. It's in the mobile devices that we're dealing with, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that we do is we train educators, formal and informal, uh, to make maps. So this is an example of one that they made. Uh, they go out, uh, if you remember, Ken Burns had that big National Parks uh, series that was going on. So we actually flew around the country training teachers to, uh, I should say educators, because we actually trained a bunch of rangers uh, who work for the National Parks, who are very, uh, very e-friendly these days. Very interesting um, to do this. We this one we, was a local training, so it's easy to show. But just as actually Tanya was talking about, you can put video in these things. So these are students or their teachers who go out with that flip fit video camera that we were showing before. Uh, they take a little piece, they make a little piece of media, they come back and they place it on a collective Google map. These are all put together and they can collaborate because Google My Maps has that wonderful collaborative feature. You just sort of invite a whole group into it. So they, we train the teachers and the teachers go back, do this with their classrooms. Uh, sometimes you know classes can't get out into the field so they actually do these trips virtually. Sometimes they actually go out to Chrissy Field or other places and make maps uh, unto themselves. Um, the only, uh, I won't mention too much more except uh, we don't have the device to show it, but most all this can be done on this device now today, right, too. And so it's very nice, with, particularly with the acceleration with the Androids um, catching up really quick. You've got iPhones, but many, many, many of these devices have this. If you use, uh, we use programs like Every Trail. In fact, Craig, who's worked on the Quest site, is actually at Every Trail right now. It's, an, it's a great little application you can download to your iPhone, and you can make a map. KQD actually is just got a grant from the NEH to do a project we call uh, Get Lost, which is we're going to go around the Bay Area and uh, film all the New Deal murals, or at least gather data, I should say, about the New Deal murals and put them on in a place-based environment so that you can, so we'll interview an expert, we'll have historical fixture, uh, pictures, et cetera. Uh, but it won't be just sort of a television show, it'll actually be a locative experience so that you'll download this application, uh, you'll be walking around the neighborhood, you'll say, oh, there's a mural over here, you want to see a little bit more about that. Uh, you can actually find it via the Google Maps as well as stand in front of there and get a different experience. Uh, when I was at Apple, one of the guys said, you know, the world is your museum. It's sort of the, the place we're moving to here. If you combine both the Google Maps as well as the RFID locative properties, uh, and the GPS embedded in devices. It becomes kind of fun.